right. Is there anybody who's a first timer on this call? You all look very familiar. Uh, right, Marianne, one of our speakers. Yes, that's true. <laughs> Great. Okay. Well, I'll start because I have a few, um, you know, think things to cover in the beginning. I want to welcome everybody. It's really great to see your faces. I know that huh, the world is pretty rough out there, but it is wonderful that we can get together at least once a month and uh, share our experiences uh, working on this uh, incredible work that we're doing to, to help our planet um, and um, move forward into a cleaner world. So I'm Rabbi Devorah Lynn. I'm the uh, co-chair. Deborah, you're breaking up. Oh dear. Well, let's keep trying. I hear her fine. I don't think she's breaking up. So maybe it's on okay. the other. Okay. So um, I'm Rabbi Devorah Lynn, and I am the uh, co-chair of Jewish Earth Alliance, um, which uh, is holding our um, members of Congress accountable, and also we uh, expanded into the agencies as well. So uh, while we're waiting for some people to, to more people to arrive, if you could put your name in the chat and uh, where you are at this moment in time and the organization that you might belong to um, that's relevant for Jewish Earth Alliance. And maybe in a couple and, and in a couple of words, uh, a reaction if you saw the eclipse this week. And even if you, or was it, la it was last week. And it, even if you weren't there in person, you two can also put in a couple words about it. I actually have on a t-shirt from the 2017 Wy uh, Wyoming eclipse that I was wearing to commemorate. Whilst you're doing that, I, I don't need to remind you that pa uh, Pesach, Passover is coming, the holiday of our liberation. And we at Jewish Earth Alliance embrace all of you for working on liberation from fossil fuels. It's a real mind shift. It's a real paradigm shift that requires getting rid of our personal chametz, our, our leaven, uh, when we go around our, our homes and clean out everything that rises, including our egos. Uh, it's a real, it, it requires um, a new philosophy of, um, and we're removing the comments of our philosophy of convenience and the idea that we cannot change or that we must suffer in order to have a cleaner and saner world. So call a kavod, more power to all of you for the inner work that you do that translates to this outer work that is the focus of Jewish Earth Alliance so necessary to heal our planet home. Thank you all for that important and deep work on both the inside and the outside. So let me read some of the chats here. Let's see. Oh, where's the chat? There it is. Okay, Nadine in, in San Anselmo. And, oh, you're in Marin County, so you must know um, Louise. Um, and Yes. So the did anybody see was the eclipse going on a little bit in California? I didn't um, hear a report about that. And uh, Susan's in Walnut Creek, California, only a partial eclipse, but it was still cool. I just watched it on, on you know, the feeds on the YouTube yes. and stuff. <laughs> so right. that's how, so, so that's D Herman, good to see you. Rosalind, um, a, uh, Adrian, happy birthday uh, from uh, Mirala says to everyone. Rosalind Altman in New Jersey, um, happy belated birthday, Adrian. Sharon from Michigan, able to see the totality for one minute in Michigan. I love the crescent shadows. Congregation Beth Haveream in Atlanta, Bill Witherspoon. Um, and uh, oh, what did I, uh, Ed say? I, um, Suzanne's in Riverside, California. The eclipse was on your birthday, Adrian. Ah, that's why everybody's <laughs> saying a, a, hap, a belated happy birthday. Melanie uh, said, only saw the crescent, but that was impressive. It's a powerful reminder of how we depend on the sun um, from Mirla. And Ed Kopf uh, in Chevy Chase, you saw that 20% better than nothing. And Mark Blumenthal in Evanston, Illinois, Ace Levine in Jewish Climate Action Network, and uh, no one else. Okay, so let us begin as 
uh, we usually do with words of inspiration from Rabbi Suzanne Singer, who grew up in New York City and is a graduate of the University of California, Berkeley. She spent 20 years as a television producer and programming executive, primarily for national public television and primarily in news and public affairs. As an executive producer of the documentary series, Point of View, she won two National Emmy Awards. Rabbi Singer was ordained by Hebrew Union College and served Temple Beth El in Riverside, California for 15 years before retiring in, 20, in 2023. She now serves a congregation Chaburim in Temecula, California on a monthly basis. In addition to the Reform Movement's Commission on Social Action, and uh, doesn't sound like retirement to me, Suzanne. So please share with us some Torah. Thank you, Devora. Yes, it's it's hard to uh, to retire as a rabbi. It, it uh, doesn't stop. So this week's Torah portion is Mitzora. It's one of those Torah portions that a bar mitzvah student dreads because it's all about some sort of skin affliction that not only affects people, but houses as well. We read, when you enter the land of Canaan that I give you as a possession, and I inflict an eruptive plague upon a house in the land you possess, the owner of the house shall come and tell the priest saying, something like a plague has appeared upon my house. Commentator Zohar Atkins asks, why does the text say Canaan instead of Israel? Well, after all, Canaan is the land of the Canaanites, but Atkins sees a deeper reason for this designation. He says, the land has two names corresponding to two ways of relating to it. Canaan represents the materialistic attitude, whereby it is just another plot of land like any other. Israel represents the elevated attitude towards the land. The land may be holy, but it can be profaned. And when that happens, it becomes Canaan once again. The plague on the house thus occurs when we treat our land as merely something to be exploited, when we forget that the land is holy, not just in Israel, but everywhere. Sara'at, this plague, is a sign of our responsibility to live a holy life. It asks, will you treat your home merely as a shelter or will you see it as kind of mini temple? an opportunity to bring God into the world, and so too with the land. Part of our mission as a holy people is to treat the land with the respect and the kavod, or the honor, with which we should treat everything and everyone. And this is why Jews care about nature. It's part of our responsibility to God's creation. And this is why during tonight's webinar, the Jewish Earth Alliance is foc focusing specifically on the preservation of forests, which are crucial parts of our global landscape. Indeed, trees are very important in our tradition. We don't have to look very far then to see the remedy for a person who is afflicted by the skin ailment, Sarat. The cure is a mixture that includes samples from the low-lying hyssop plant and from a cedar tree. Clearly, our ancestors understood the healing power and special nature of plants and trees. From the very beginning of the Torah, trees feature prominently. Think about the creation story. The Midrash or expansion on the text teaches, when God created the first person, God took them and showed them all the trees of the garden and said to them, see my works, how beautiful and praiseworthy they are. And everything that I created, I created it for you. Be careful not to spoil or destroy my world for if you do, there will be nobody left after you to repair it. And Rabbi Akiva Wolf notes that this Midrash singles out the trees of the Garden of Eden rather than the Garden of Eden itself. And these trees represent the work of the creator. He asks, why should trees be chosen to symbolize the natural world? Because trees are the pinnacle of the plant world, which transforms the earth from a barren and lifeless mass into an environment capable of supporting other forms of life, such as animals and humans. We find this expressed in another Midrash. The phrase, because a human is a tree of the field, teaches that the life of the human being is from the tree. 
Likewise, Rabbeinu Bahya, a medieval Jewish philosopher, writes, the commentators explain that the life of a person and their food is from a tree of the field. And it's not the way of a wise and understanding nation to needlessly destroy something so worthy. And therefore, you should not cut down a tree of the field. Rather, you should protect it from destruction and damage and take benefit from it. And the 18th and 19th century Bible commentator, Mayam Loez, writes, a person's life is dependent on trees. And the tree is so important for the existence of the world that the sages establish a special blessing for those who go out and see blossoming fruit producing trees. And of course, lest we forget, the Torah is called a tree of life. Speaking of which, there is a beautiful Hasidic Midrash that claims that there is only one tree in the Garden of Eden, not two. The tree was a kind of Rorschach test. Depending on how one looked at it, it was either the tree of life, a life-sustaining tree, or it was the tree of knowledge of good and evil, a tree whose fruit could serve our wants, desires, and needs. Or as Rabbi Tamar Elad Applebaum explains, we were supposed to appreciate the tree in the Garden of Eden for its life-giving force, not as something to exploit. So either we see ourselves as part of the natural cycle of things, or we look at a world in a utilitarian way, exploiting its resources and people for our own benefit. Rabbi David Seidenberg affirms that for the Kabbalists, a fruit tree was both the ultimate metaphor and manifestation for both the tree of life and for the way God's blessing is manifest in the world. It was and is an image of God in the full sense of that phrase, uniting heaven and earth through its branches and roots, giving freely of its energy and gifts through its fruit. And it turns out that we can learn a lot from trees. In the book, Finding the Mother Tree, the author writes, I was tapping into the messages that the trees were relaying back and forth through a cryptic underground fungal network. When I followed the clandestine path of the conversations, I learned that this network is pervasive through the entire forest floor, connecting all the trees in a constellation of tree hubs and fungal links. A crude map revealed stunningly that the biggest, oldest timbers are the sources of fungal connections to regenerating seedlings. Not only that, they connect to all neighbors, young and old, which are perceiving, communicating, and responding by emitting chemical signals, chemicals identical to our own neurotransmitters. The old trees nurture the young ones and provide them with food and water, just as we do with our own children. When mother trees die, they pass their wisdom to their kin, generation after generation, sharing the knowledge of what helps and what harms, who is friend or foe, and how to adapt and survive in an ever-changing landscape. The author, Suzanne Samard, concludes, concludes with, this is not a book about how we can save trees. This is a book about how the trees can save us. So let's not destroy the forests in our world. Yes, you go ahead. Thank you. Yes, very powerful. Suzanne, thank you for reminding us how our relationship with trees is so incredibly powerful and dependent on each other. Thank you again. All right, uh, uh, Mirla Goldsmith, our co uh, co my co-chair, is going to update us on our recent actions and what's been happening with Jewish Earth Alliance. Mirla. Thank you so much, Rabbi Singer. I love the image of the trees connecting the earth with the heavens. We really need that. We need to feel connected. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, before I get started, I noticed that um, Dr. Adrienne Levine is on the call today, and she is the director and founder of JTree, which is a wonderful project to enable us to plant trees in uh, the United States National Forest. Um, Ace, please put the link in the chat so people can participate in your wonderful project. Okay, now. It is my great pleasure to announce that we have two new members of the Jewish Earth Alliance Steering Committee. Elliot Rabin from New York and Bill Witherspoon from Atlanta have joined us. 
They are both extraordinary leaders in their own communities, and we are so lucky that they have agreed to bring their energy and wisdom to our national organizing. Thank you, Bill, and thank you, Elliot. Now, it is my pleasure to bring you up to date on a few actions. So first, a little good news. Maybe you'll remember that in March, we took action to clean up power plants. We wrote to EPA Administrator Michael Regan. Now the media is reporting that our pressure is working. EPA is going to toughen up those standards for new gas powered, power, new gas powered power plants before the regulation is issued. This is very important because we're expecting a surge in construction of gas fired power plants. Not good, but at least they'll be regulated. And this is due to the construction of many data centers. Those of you who are fighting data centers in your communities, these are the repercussions. Um, now you may recall that the EPA decided not to regulate existing power plants. Well, the EPA is beginning to explore issuing those regulations as well. And look in the newsletter for a link to submit some early comments on that process. Now on lobby day, we advocated for climate solutions in the farm bill. We thought for sure that the farm bill would be passed this year. Well, so far it hasn't been passed and negotiations are continuing. We do have some good news. The Senate proposed bill has incorporated improvements in the EKIP program, that's the Environmental Quality Incentives Program for farmers, which is one of the things that we asked for. The bad news is that the House has their own proposed farm bill, which does not incorporate our priorities of climate solution. We're not clear when this will move forward, but we need to stay vigilant. And then finally, remember the Recovering America's Wildlife Act? Who remembers it? Raise your hand. <laughs> we must have advocated for that three or four times at least. Well, House it passed the House. Remember, we got it through the House, but not through the Senate. House Republicans have introduced a similar bill. However, it has a fatal flaw, which is that the funding would be taken from existing conservation funding in the Inflation Reduction Act and the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act. So that means they would be taking money away from other conservation programs to put here. Democrats are so far not supporting taking away this funding. So they are not supporting this bill. Um, and our allies furthermore want uh, to um, emphasize that the bill that we're supporting would provide for dedicated permanent funding. So for now, that bill is unlikely to move. So we'll keep you posted on everything that's happening. Terrific. It's so good to hear the follow-up uh, and successes to our work. Keeps us all moving forward. Um, I, I, so Bill Witherspoon and, and Elliot Rabin, ra raise your hand so we can see you on the screen. And I wanted to give a shout out to Elliot, um, gave a great talk on trees at uh, Limud, the, um, uh, in, the, I guess it's an international study session. Uh, Bill, did you want to say something? <laughs> uh, so that was great. I guess it's uh, recorded if you want to um, search on that. Uh, maybe we can put a link in the um, chat. Bill, your hand is up. Did you want to say hello? No, when you said raise hand so you could be seen, I oh, assume well. you meant to that. So that's what I did. Okay. Yeah. All right, so put it down so I don't get too confused. <laughs> There you go. All right. So thank you very much, Mirella, for filling us in. Our speaker tonight will help us expand our knowledge about our action alert on this wonderful Forest Act. Marianne Comfort is Justice Coordinator for Earth, Anti-Racism, and Women for the Sisters of Mercy of the Americas, which is based in Silver Spring, Maryland. She actively participates in interfaith coalitions that are advancing environmental and climate justice and accompanying water and land, and she accompanies water and land defenders protesting their human rights. Marianne serves on the board of the of Laudati Si movement, which mobilizes and equips Catholics around the world to respond to Pope Francis's call to hear both the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor. 
We know here at Jewish Earth Alliance, Marianne from WISC, W-I-S-C, the Washington Interfaith Staff Community, which is a network of over 70 Washington offices of national religious bodies and faith-based organizations who collaborate on advocacy for the US government policies that advance a more just, peaceful, and ecologically sustainable world. So welcome to our friend, Marianne Comfort. So Thank good. you so much. It's great to be here with you. Um, you. Love to, I, and I was, was mistaken when I said this is my first time. I did join you um, one month, a year or so ago when you did a, a program on regulations that was so informative. So it's great to be with you on this side of the, of the screen. So I'm gonna be talking about the Forest Act. And what I'd like to do is to, um, my slides line up, there we go. What I'd like to do is just share a little bit about what is the situation that we're dealing with. Um, I was so moved by Rabbi Suzanne Singer, your, your reflection was, was just really beautiful and really sets the context. And I think we're aware of that situation, but we'll kind of review that real quickly. And then talk a about um, how our faith calls us to that. And I'm gonna share one lens for, for advocacy that we've been using. And then we'll talk about the details of the bill itself and then go into um, our advocacy campaign and how you can uh, contribute to that. So the big issue we're looking at is um, illegal deforestation. Um, we know that, that deforestation is a huge driver of climate change. We know that um, it um, hinders biodiversity. Um, it hinders the livelihoods and very lives of peoples of the forest and um, very, very big concern. And we're focusing here on illegal deforestation although of course deforestation more broadly is, is of great concern. When we're talking about this, um, what difference can the faith community uh, make? And I think, you know, Rab the Rabbi Suzanne Singer, you really, you're talking about um, looking at the land as Canaan, as a land to be exploited, or as Israel, the elevated version. And then how do we look at our home as just shelter or as a more spiritual, entity. And that's exactly what Pope Francis was saying in his environmental uh, letter to all peoples. It wasn't just written to Catholics. It was written to all people of goodwill. And he talks about care of our common home, another way of phrasing our shelter being our whole planet, um, not just our individual homes. And he talks about um, hearing both the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor, that we can't just address in silos the environmental crisis and while it's very important to be planting trees, it's very important to be addressing biodiversity and climate change themselves, we also have to be looking at the impacts on people and particularly the most vulnerable who are both impacted by the environmental degradation of the exploitation of the land that you mentioned, as well as most impacted by climate change itself. So talking about, yet I think we as people of faith, that's one unique thing that we can talk about is that we have a deep seated concern for earth, our common home, the sacred common home, as well as a concern for um, God's people. And so we talk about environmental justice, not just environmentalism. And I think that's um, the, the key thing that we, that we bring to this. Now the, the Pope Francis's teaching came out in 2015. And just before that, he had made a trip to the Amazon rainforest, to Puerto Maldonado in Peru. And he was so touched by meeting the indigenous peoples there and really made a commitment that the church was going to um, walk with them and accompany them in their struggles. And so over the next few years after that, we saw the development of one church and a network of the Amazon called RIPAM. And um, then there also is a, a church network in the Congo Basin in Africa, another very critical ecosystem. And there's now also um, these church networks in Mesoamerica, Central America, in um, Asia, and also in the uh, Guarani aquifer and in um, South America as well. 
So it was kind of the church's um, kind of commitment to standing with um, the peoples of these really critical ecosystems and helping them defend their, their land and their rights. So then in 2019, um, the Vatican actually called this big, huge upper level meeting called a synod. And all these um, cardinals went to the Vatican. And for the first time, they invited um, non-cardinals and non-church hierarchy people to a meeting like this. And they had all these indigenous leaders from the Amazon who came. And it was a whole conversation around the Amazon where you had people of the church people of um, of the, the Amazon territory, of those nine countries coming together and really grappling with the exploitation, grappling with um, the love of the land and talking about the poetry of the of that of that land and talking about the richness of the people. A lot of the news reports were about, you know, the talk about you know, empowering women more in the church and about having married men in the church. And those were discussed, but really the people of the Amazon were really making clear that they they were most wanting to talk about their territory, about that land, about their, their home, as we talked about in all its dimensions. So out of that, we here in um, those of us uh, in, in Catholic organizations here in Washington, DC, we, we wanted to see how we could be supportive of these church networks. So we have often hosted uh, delegates from RAPAM, the church network of the Amazon when they've come to DC. Sometimes it's been indigenous leaders who have come and they have been trained in presenting their human rights cases to the Inter-American Human Rights Commission here in DC and to forums at the United Nations and such. They come to the United States for these opportunities. And some of us have hosted them and created educational opportunities and advocacy opportunities. So next week, we have a delegation of some of the church leaders of RIPOM coming from the Amazon, uh, two of the staff, the executive staff of the network, as well as a bishop as a happens of Puerto Maldonado, which is the origination of RAPAM, and a lawyer are going to be coming to DC for the week. And we're going to be creating some educational opportunities for them to talk about what does deforestation look like in their territory? How is it affecting the people? What are the, what are the exploitative pra uh, practices, the extracting of natural resources in their territory? that is very problematic and challenging their way of life, even challenging their spirituality of not having it hard to practice their spirituality and religious practices if the land around them is being uh, devastated. And then also, um, you know, talking about, of course, the human rights of the people as people are trying to defend their land, the oppression um, they face. So this is gonna be an opportunity for us to um, learn from them, hear from them. And we also are setting up some advocacy um, opportunities. So we're gonna be meeting with some uh, members of Congress and uh, maybe some members of the Biden administration for them to tell their story about what's happening in the Amazon and use the, the stories as a way to talk about deforestation and the Forest Act. So it's like, how do the, we, we, I think that's another thing that we as people of faith have for this work is we have stories. We know the people on the ground in our faith communities who can tell us what they're seeing about deforestation. We can hear um, how deeply they feel connected to these forested areas. We can hear about um, how devastating it is to have gold mining or timber or illegal agricultural practices happening on their land. And these are stories that we can then bring to Congress and to the administration. And we'll have that opportunity to do that next week. So what does the Forest Act do? So it's got this long title, the Fostering Overseas Rule of Law and Environmentally Sound Trade Act, Forest Act. And basically it's looking at how can we use trade um, and trade policy to stem illegal deforestation. And the real important thing to name here is we're talking about illegal deforestation. Over in Europe, the European Union has passed a much more broad deforestation regulation that addresses deforestation more broadly 
and it's scaring the heck out of our legislators and industry here in the United States. So they're really fearful that um, uh, about the U.S. adopting uh, similar standards. And so we're doing baby steps. We're first going to address illegal deforestation and stressing to them that that's what we're talking about and not making any mention at all that we're, you know, we're in line with the EU, you know, all those kind of things, because that's just going to scare people off. So we're talking right now about illegal deforestation based on the laws of the producing countries. So I've been in some meetings, um, particularly with red, red, uh, Republican Senate offices, and that part of illegal is really important because they want to say, well, we don't want to be telling other countries um, what they can, you know, for us, what can they log or not. And we're saying, well, we're just helping them. We're we're making sure that we're not buying things that you, country Peru or Brazil or Colombia or what have you, we're just going to be enforcing their own laws. So that seems to be um, calm some of the nerves down a little bit that we're talking about illegal deforestation. We're also focusing on specific commodities. So cattle, making sure the beef that's coming to us is not on illegally forested land, cocoa, chocolate products, palm oil, which you look on the label of a lot of foods is in everything, and then rubber and soy. And uh, one of the other, some of the other talking points we talk about is about this is promoting good governance. We want to make sure that, you know, we're not, you know, in uh, encouraging illegal behavior of illegal deforestation. We talk about protect, pro, uh, protecting American farmers. This seems to resonate with some of our um, senators in the Midwest that, you know, their cattle farmers shouldn't be competing but from people who are um, illegally uh devastating for us to, to raise cattle in Brazil, for instance. Um, and then as consumers, we can talk about, we want greater confidence that what we're buying on the grocery store, store shelves is sustainably and ethically made. We can't know that for now. So as consumers, we have a little skin in the game. And then of course we talk about um, that we're concerned about contributions to climate change, and then because of our relationships with people in the Amazon and other networks um, in other uh, other parts of the world, um, we also talk about the people, people who are um, being impacted by this illegal defor deforestation. Again, hearing the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor. So this has led us to this advocacy campaign of where we have um, mobilized uh, a whole range of organizations. There's a secular forest and trade coalition that's headed up by the WWF, the World Wildlife Fund, and um, the Environmental Investigative Agency, and then a whole bunch of environmental groups. And then I chair what's called the Interreligious Working Group on Extractive Industries. And that is a DC-based coalition of all kinds of groups that um, talks about what, how do we look at the harms of extracting natural resources from the earth, uh, the harms to the environment and to our human communities. So we started hearing about this forest act and we said, well, this sounds like a really important bill and maybe even winnable. And so we kind of jumped on that and have been riding the coattails of that, that work. So we're work working with secular partners and I must say that the secular partners are really valuing our, our uh, partnership and seeing that we have been able to get meetings where they have not. We've been able to move people where they have not. Um, when this bill was introduced in the last Congress, it was bipartisan in the House, but was only Democratic sponsored in the Senate. And so before it was introduced at the end of 2023, the big push was we wanted, really wanted to have it bipartisan in the Senate. So we had um, some state-based delegations of Catholics that were going and meeting with um, some of their senators around what became the IRA back in summer of 22. And um, we kind of transitioned them into advocating for the Forest Act in uh, 2023. And we have this really gung-ho group of Catholics in Indiana hit, headed by a Catholic sister who were just after Senator Braun. They said he's a conservationist. He's got a, you know, he's got a like this. They had meetings with his staff. 
They found out he was going to be visiting his church and they drove some distances to visit the church and hand him a document about saying how Catholics should care about deforestation. And we had a meeting with his staff the Monday after that. And the staff member said, the first thing the senator said when he came in this morning after he said hi, was you got to look at the Forest Act. And he handed him the paper that the twister had given him over the weekend. So we, and, and then after a lot of other conversations with industry and so, so forth, Senator Braun came on. So we now are bipartisan in the Senate. So never estimate the, the power of uh, the faith voices in, in moving these things. Um, and exactly. so what the coalition, yeah, amen, right? What the coalition <laughs> right. strategy now is and what Senator Schatz is the prime sponsor, and he's doing a deliberate strategy of having people come in by twos, Noah's Ark style, that they don't want to have all these Democrats and only one lone Republican. So they want to have, if a Democrat wants to sign on, they got to get a Republican buddy. They want them to be kind of lined up so that it's equal equal partnership. So if you have a senator that you're friendly with on the Democratic side, you can nudge them to say, if you want to sign on to the Forest Act, you can even look and see if they saw, were co-sponsor in the last Congress and say, we'd love you to sign on, but we know you need to have a Republican buddy. Go have lunch with your Republican colleagues and see who you can get. Um, so I think that's a really wise strategy in the House. Um, they're not having such a, you know, a rule. So they're they're open to anyone signing on. And right now it's all Democrats except for Representative Fitzpatrick from um, Pennsylvania. So we've got some work there to do as well. So we, um, when we knew that this was going to be introduced at the end of December, and then we had our holiday time when not much business is going on. So early in early February, um, so I, since the end of December through the end of January, we put out the call for faith-based organizations at the national, state, and local level to sign our faith letter in support of the Forest Act. And then we sent it to the members of the House Ways and Means Committee, which is the one that's going to first see it in the House. And then we brought it to the Senate Finance Committee that's going to first see it in the Senate. And so we sent that... Um, letter with about 90 some groups at that time. Um, still kept asking people to sign on and we um, sent it out again to all the Senate and House offices in time for um, International Day of Forests on March 21st. And I see some of the groups here are actually on it, um, are assigned onto this letter. So I'm really grateful to Mirla for getting that out to all of you and very grateful, grateful to that. So every campaign needs to have a logo. So we have this beautiful logo that our friends at the Mary Noel Office of Global Concerns um, had for us, the Past Forest Act logo. And we also have talking points, which every campaign also needs to have, which basically is the slide you saw a minute ago. Um, we also yeah, had- it was really um, interesting, Marianne, how um, you know many of us are, are familiar with fair trade and um, uh, and that feeling of buying things in the grocery store and not knowing the full story and the impact on on uh, local people, so uh, it's a, something that can touch everybody. So that's really great. And I think that we and that's what we say in the letter. It's a very short letter, and but there is one line that as consumers, you know, we want to speak not as people of faith and also as as consumers. So absolutely. Right. I think that's a, a great talking point and one that seems to to resonate. I want to see if we have a few questions. We have time for sure. uh, great. Other questions. Um, if you have questions, if you could put them in the chat would be helpful. But um, let me call on Suzanne. Suzanne, why don't you um, ask yours? Thanks. I, I couldn't find my little hand thing. Um, I'm just wondering uh, about enforcement, like if this does pass. Is there like money and and by the way, thank you for your excellent presentation. Very very comprehensive and, and clear. Um, yeah. So what what kind of enforcement mechanism is there for this? So one of the differences between last year, the last Congress's um, bill and this bill is that some of the funding was stripped out. You know, there had to be some negotiations between Senator Braun and Senator Schatz. So it, re it relies a lot on supply chain uh, monitoring. 
And there's a lot of, you know, technical mechanisms of that that I'm not even going to try to pretend that that I understand. But there is a lot of like looking at um, setting up supply chain um, mechanisms and also um, looking at, you know, some level of, I don't know if they can say penalties, but some level of enforcement of, of some kind, there has to be some kind of supply chain due diligence to make sure it is from legally forested land. Um, and that's still, to be clear, to be honest, that still is a sticking point with some offices. So there probably is going to be some updating and, and changing of that to kind of come in line. We we learned in one of our meetings that there's even um, some uh, agencies within the federal government that are really skeptical about this because they're seeing all the work that this is going to put on them. Um, to have to do all the monitoring and supply chain um, and enforcement and things. So I think there's still going to be need to be some um, some more conversation on that. And we're certainly getting a lot of questions on that. And frankly, you know, refer them to Senator Schatz and Senator Braun so they can, you know, tease that out and have more of that conversation. So that certainly is. And one of the things we're hearing, too, again, we're talking about illegal deforestation. And we hear from our our partners in country that there's a lot of shell game that goes on that you might start you know off um, raising cattle and you know illegally deforest some land start raising the cattle and then move them to land that's been legally cleared so there's a lot of loopholes um and so we know that this is not an airtight bill and it's nowhere near a perfect bill but it's a step in the door to look at that to look it's a at step this. in the right direction thank you, thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah. Nadine Halusik um, asks, does this act include corporations like McDonald's regarding cutting forests for cattle? Are you attempting to schedule a meeting uh, in DC with Deb, is it Holland, Hayland? Oh, of the Interior Department. Mm -hmm. So um, so what this would require would be that, say McDonald's would have to make sure that its um, hamburgers are coming from not, you know, from legally deforested land, if it's even coming from, you know, Brazil, it would be the primary uh, country. So what's happening is that our secular partners in particular are doing a lot of advocacy and meetings with um, industry and industry associations. So right now the Cattlemen's Association of America has come out in favor of this bill and is speaking out in that because, you know, it can only serve their purposes um, to make sure they're not competing against these products elsewhere. And it could create a bigger market for their, you know, U.S. hamburgers for McDonald's. It'd be a lot easier for McDonald's to buy their meat from the U.S. and not have to worry about um, whether it's um, illegally, you know, procured from Brazil. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot of industry um, work that that is, is being done. <coughs> Great. Good. And uh, Melanie was just mentioning that uh, when we lob in the last lobbying session we did, um, that they talked to Senator Brown about his love of trees. So maybe there was some dovetailing there. Um, there we go. Think, so it was, yeah, the Jewish and the Catholics once again partnering and, and doing great advocacy. <laughs> there you I go. Love that. Um, Stephen Sondheim has a question. Yeah. Hi. Thank you very much. Um, I loved the tree in my front yard when I was growing up. It was an oak tree and I used to climb it way, way out on a limb and it would blow and it, I pretended I was on a, a ship, a sailboat. Anyway, I would, the one of the, I'm always into win-win stuff. So I have a couple of questions. One is sort of what's the major resistance to this? Who and why? And then around that, are there, mechanisms by which they can get what they need without doing this illegally. Uh, and one of them might be cost, but can you talk a bit about that? I mean, sure. So, so one okay, of, some of the you. pushback, yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. So some of the pushback has been from industry. Mostly it seems to be they're very skittish because of the um, European Union's regulations and they're really afraid that this is going to be the slippery slope that we're going to pass this illegal deforestation bill, and then it's going to lead to a much broader regulations against all um, defor you know deforestation in in our trade policies. So there's that. 
Um, in the original bill, there was a lot of language around climate change and that we're doing this for climate change. That A lot of that got stripped out in this bill. Um, so it's more Republican friendly language and is an in your face, you know, climate change um, talk. So that seems to have been mollified um, that that particular um, backlash. And then, yeah, there's just, you know, some skittishness of people just around, um, you know, that there, there, it was some uh, uh, money allocated to this and there was some skittishness around that. And some of that was pared down as well. I think it's mostly, you know, concerns around, like, I know the timber industry has really been really skittish, even though it just doesn't, this doesn't relate to them at all. There's already built, there's already a law called the Lacey Act that regulates a lot of timber, but the timber industry for some reason has just got really heated up about mm -hmm. this and really concerned um, about this. Um, again, about the trade and worrying where this is gonna lead, you know, so unfortunately, all the press around the um, EU uh, regulations um, is kind of been in hindrance because it's just um, made people skittish about a much broader way of looking at this. Well, thank you. Let me do a follow up like, well, real quickly, what is overwhelming about the EU's bills? Are they, is it unreasonable? And then secondly, it's sort of along the same lines. If people or companies that do need timber, uh, are there ways they can do it in a equitable, I don't mean the word equitable, in a integrated way that doesn't cause a lot of damage? So I really can't answer the second because I'm not a, a expert on, on, you know, on timber or logging. So I have to uh, defer to that. Um, the first one, the, and the uh, European Union regulation is talking about supply chain due diligence about deforestation more broadly. So they're not making a distinction between illegal and legal. So they're getting pushback from other countries saying, you know, how can you interfere in our what we deem, you know, OK for deforestation and our, you know, how we're we're allowing cattle raising or what have you. Um, and then you're also having a lot of industries who are saying, well, wow, that's really broad. Um, you know, how are you going, what, you know, how are we going to have to check our supply chain to know where exactly it's coming from and what kind of um, deforestation, you know, what deforestation is happening. So I think it's a really broad nature of it. And this is much more targeted and narrow by design. And um, it's just kind of getting lumped in and people are, some unfortunately early on some some advocates were saying well the us should pass the forest act so that we align with the european union so that you know we don't have different standards all around the world and we have since learned that it's not helpful and we should stay away from that because um they don't want to hear that we're going to align with the eu because it's just way overly broad hmm. well maria okay. thank you thank you, thank you. Uh, Thank you, Stephen. And uh, Marianne, thank you so much for joining us tonight. This was a, a really um, clear explanation and, and will help us with our action tonight. We're going to actually act on this. And um, I wanted to um, uh, introduce our steering um, from our steering committee. Thank you so much, um, Marianne, for uh, being here tonight. Um, Judy Burlfine from Encinitas, California will lead our action tonight as is uh, her usual position. We're very grateful in her steadfast devotion to explaining and motivating our partners to act while we are, uh, while we have your attention now. So um, Judy, let me turn it over to you and uh, you'll get us started on acting. Okay. On action and alert tonight. Amy, you'll put up my slides. So thank you very much, Marianne. And um, I have a like a mini reiteration of what you just told us. But we're going to now move forward and take action. So why don't you move ahead, Amy? So this bill, as Marianne said, was introduced in 2023. And, and um, we have in the Senate 
the original sponsor from Hawaii, Senator Schatz, and now we um, also have Senator Braun on board as the original co-sponsor. And in the House, we have 25 co-sponsors. So it's moving in with um, mostly Democrat, but one Republican. And um, we heard all this, it prohib prohibits importation of products made or produced on illegally deforest deforested land. And I'm sure you can all relate to this, of wondering where your product comes from, especially chocolate. Would hate to have to feel bad about eating chocolate. Okay, um, keep going, Amy. So as I mentioned, these are the two um, sponsors and co-sponsors currently in the Senate. And tonight we are going to send an email to our senators, if you, um, start with one, and ideally you'll have time to do it to both of them and, and after the call, write to our house members. So here um, is a quick overview of the house members who are already co-sponsoring. If you're in California, there's a lot of them already on board, eight of them, that's the top lines of this slide and then two from Illinois. Um, thank you to Brian Fitzpatrick, the one Republican. And then along the bottom, there's single House members from all those different states. So if you don't remember what you see here, you can always Google it and it'll tell you who the co-sponsors on. Okay, next slide, Amy. So Let's not one. forget coffee, Judy. Right? Coffee. Yeah, I don't drink coffee, but I know. <laughs> but, for, but for those of you who do. <laughs> so um, we're going to move ahead and um, pull. I think all of you have done this, so you kind of know the drill, but open a tab on your uh, in your browser and go to the website for one of your senators. So if you're from California, I would you know, we have Padilla and um, we also have our our senator who's somewhat temporary, LaFonza Butler. So it would be padilla.senate.gov. If you're from another state, it's just their last name and pull up their site. And they usually it's pretty obvious how to contact them. And then there'll be a drop down menu on the topic and you can say that this is related to the environment or if there's another subject that seems more appropriate, you can choose that. And here's the simple message that I've crafted. You of course can make it more extensive. Americans wanna do the right thing. Help us avoid supporting deforestation. Limit imports produced on e illegally deforested land. And um, now having learned from Marianne that we wanna do this in a Noah's Ark style, if your Senator is a Democrat, um, I would rephrase this slightly from please co-sponsor the Forest Act to um, please co-sponsor and let's see, and recruit a Republican to join you. And if your senator is a Republican, then you can just ask them to co-sponsor. I don't think it'll be that hard to find a Democrat. So I'm going to um, be quiet for a minute now and let you pull up the tab and craft your message. If you want to add something more specifically about how this relates to your um, connection with Judaism, that would be great. And if you finish writing to one senator, then pull up the tab for the for your other senator and and um, send it to them. And after we hang up, please write to your representative as well. If you have any questions, oh, Nadine has her hand up. Do you have a question? Uh, yes, is a phone call just as good as a letter, or do you prefer the the written? I think either works. Marianne, if you have a thought on that, unmute and give your perspective. There is, I do have the phone number listed there for people who prefer. Yeah, I think phone, um, what we hear from staffers is that phone calls are a little higher weighted than emails. Oh, okay. 
Okay. In the past, and also, do, do we mention that we're a member of JEA, or is that not part of our introduction? You can do that. Um, when I, Nadine, I think you're in California. I'm not sure. When I've called Padilla, he doesn't have an option for leaving a message. So, hmm. I think I've left messages for him before, but okay. Uh, maybe well, maybe I gave up a few months. And, and then my other uh, Feinstein was hard on that. But then my other question is: Is are we going to try to call the other senator uh, from California? She wasn't. She oh. didn't make a meeting with us. I don't know if she's functioning. <laughs> yeah. Um, I we, would. It, I wouldn't make that the highest priority if you can contact your representative. And, and the last thing is, do you have a list? I, I didn't, I saw the list of our representatives, but I didn't see a, a slide that showed if we had any senators that had supported it so we could thank them. So just two, um, who, the Senator oh. Schatz who sponsored it and Senator Braun. Who oh, okay. It's just the sponsor so far. Okay. Thank you. Co-sponsor. Well, where's the tab we click on? So you, so you open another tab so you can on your in your browser so you can um, go to the website of your of your senator. Does that make sense? Yes. And and once you've written, put it in the chat so we can clap for you and know that we're all in this together. Maury, do you have a question? You're, you're on mute, Maury. Senator Butler from California is definitely functioning because we just dealt with her on another issue. That's great. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I would hate to discourage you. It definitely doesn't hurt to contact her. So contact her. She's there until... November at least. Are we also asking our representatives to co-sponsor? Yes. Yes, if they're not already listed on the... Okay, but it's a, it's a Senate bill, right? Well, there's one in the Senate and one in the House. Oh, do you know what the House bill is? Yeah, it's listed right. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't... Oh, it HR. Doesn't... Oh, I see. It... I okay. just saw it go by for a second. Yeah, HR Amy, go something. back. Yeah, HR 6515. Thank you. Ah. Okay, so we're going to give this a, a, a couple more minutes, a few more minutes, and then we're going to wind up the meeting. Um, and you are welcome to stay after the meeting and ask uh, to ask questions or uh, share reflections for about ten or fifteen minutes, okay. or to finish, or to finish your email, or to finish your email. Probably, if you write it now, you're more likely to get it done. Yes. What is the okay. number of the Senate bill? The Senate bill is S3371. It's, it's on this slide. It says take action now. Contact your senators regarding S3371. Hmm. Thank you. Wait, do Marilyn, do, do I have it wrong or did you just leave the one off of that? You're muted. Great job. Thank you to all of you who contacted.
Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, how about another two minutes? And then we will um, go to sign off. But again, if you'd like to stay on with uh, questions or comments, that would be great. We'll stay on for another 10 minutes or so. I wanna thank uh, Judith Burlf Judy Burlfine um, for acting here and all of you for acting here and now. It's the best time to do it. So thank you all for showing up tonight. That's half the battle, isn't it? Showing up. And uh, perhaps at your Seder tables, you can bring up these, uh, this issue in particular, it would be very relevant at Passover, at Pesach time. We're going to conclude tonight's meeting with some words from our steering committee member, Rabbi Melanie Aaron, to move us into Pesach. After Melanie's closing, if you'd like to stay on, uh, we'll be here for another 10 minutes. I wish you all a sweet Pesach a deep Passover and healing among friends and family and may peace break out across the world. Thank you all. I wanna thank um, Mirla uh, and Judy and uh, all our steering committee from, from uh, contributing and especially a, a shout out to Amy Dick for uh, handling our technology. Thank you all. So Melanie, please. So I'm sure many of you have noticed that this year, Earth Day and Passover come together. And that allows us to think about this Jewish holiday in perhaps a different light. Um, the holiday has many themes this year, I think especially as we celebrate Passover, we think of the words, let my people go. We pray for the hostages, the chatufim, the chatufot, um, who are still being kept from their families. As we eat the matzah, the bread of affliction, we think of the suffering of so many innocents, the physical hunger of some, and the hunger of so many for a sense of safety and security. In the Bible, Passover is called Chag HaPesach and Chag HaMatzot, but it is also Chag HaAviv, the spring festival. And you probably noticed this year, we had a leap month, an extra month, in our lunar calendar, just to make sure that Passover didn't come before it was really springtime. So um, it worked in Washington, DC, at least. I've been walking outside, the trees have all budded, the light green leaves are appearing, and the spring is um, here in our land. You probably associate Chag um, Ha'aviv, the spring holiday, also with the green that we have on our Seder plate. We say a blessing, whether in your family over parsley or celery or some other vegetable as a sign of the season. So I thought we might think for a minute about how we will mark our Passover this year as Chag Aviv, as the spring holiday. Um, maybe by reading a few verses from Shir Hasharim, the Song of Songs, which is a beautiful celebration of nature. Or maybe with some contemporary poem that reminds you to actually open your eyes and notice the beauty of our natural world. 
Um, maybe in discovering that you can go without leaven for seven or eight days, depending on your custom, um, you can consider reducing other things like reducing the amount of meat that you consume, helping our planet in that way. Or maybe you wanna make a commitment that during the 40 days of the Omer, as we count from Passover to Shavuot, that you'll use public transportation or carpooling instead of driving all alone in your car and um, having an impact, a footprint in that way. So as we think about these different ways of celebrating, plant a tree in your backyard, very nice, and very in keeping with our theme this evening. As you go forward to celebrate Passover, we hope you'll consider um, bringing the spring element into the holiday. And uh, together with all of us on the steering committee, we wish you Aziz and Pesach, a happy and joyous Passover. Rabbi, could you please tell us what's on your shirt? Oh, sorry. <laughs> it says, don't fetch, organize. And that seems um, appropriate. Fetching is to complain and to moan and to groan. And there's a lot to moan and groan about. But the only way really to move forward is to organize with other people. And that's what we hope we're doing. Yes, and now they have some um, data to say that, that it helps with um, despair. <laughs> that, uh, that being uh, despairing and worrying about and having anxiety about things doesn't get us anywhere. But action does, as we found out tonight from Mirala, the uh, action that we, actions that we've been working on um, are having success. Thank you very much to our speakers, Suzanne and Marianne. Always welcome back. Thank you, Marianne. It's nice to see you after joining um, your your group letter. It's nice that you've gotten to the next stage. Yeah, thank you so much for your support there. Uh, Louise, I want to shout out to Louise Lipsy. You brought about ten people that we had uh, tonight at the meeting. <laughs> Well worth being here. <laughs> that was